spring practice starts for Alabama today. So 2024 can officially begin. Happy New Year. You are Locked On Bama, your daily podcast on the Alabama Crimson Tide. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, everybody. Welcome back into Locked On Bama. Luke Robinson, that's me, Jimmy Stein, that's him. This episode is brought to you by Nissan, and I'll talk about Nissan here in just a minute. I'm pretty sure Jimmy did get a new Nissan after my fantastic live read. <laughs> I yesterday. was hoping so. It was a good live read, and I, I'm I'm interested in learning more. I'm interested in the live read again. I want to hear more about the Google Assistant thing. That's I was blown away by that. Uh, Jimmy, spring practice begins yes. today. It's a big deal. Um and you guys over at BOL did a great little write-up about mm-hmm. uh, what you want to see, what, you, what you're expecting, um, returning player with the most to prove, and uh, newcomer to keep an eye on. You know, I'm going to start with something you guys talked about, the first thing you'll look for at practice. What, what is that going to be today? Well, uh, media is actually going to be able to cover Wednesday's practice and not That's today. Right. So – uh, the media will not be there today. We're hoping we're going to get, get photography. What? You'll get some reports from today. Well, we'll get, uh, we might get some reports possibly from sources. That, that's possible. But but really, uh, we're hoping to get photography and video from today's practice that we can uh, go over like the Zapruder film. Uh, we, we hope that will happen, although I don't think we're certain. What we're definitely getting today that I'm greatly looking forward to Uh, And I like your New Year's uh, analogy because it does feel like the 2024 year, the 2024 football year starts today. It does feel like, hey, this is the, well, and it is, it's the first time the 2024 football team practices together. Uh, So it is hugely significant in that way. But what I'm most looking forward to, Luke, uh, in so many ways, and I'm curious to hear your reaction to this, is uh, just seeing Kalen DeBoer in a post-practice press conference because, You know, this has been the Saban thing. Saban mastered this. I think Saban was the only press conference in the country that was watched by fans other than the fans of that particular school. Uh, His sound bites were often featured on SEC Network and ESPN. Uh, No other coach had his press conference sound bites out there on just a standard, you know, any other practice sort of thing. So it's going to be weird seeing uh, Kalen DeBoer up there, presumably with a Coke bottle uh, that may or may not be delivered by Cedric Burns. Uh, You know, (laughs) curious as to how that looks. Uh, And of course, this will really be Kalen's first chance. He's talked about players on the team. Uh, He has talked to some extent, but today will be his first press conference where he's seen these guys play. Kalen's comments on watching Jalen Milrow play quarterback, watching Jan Miller and Justice Haynes at running back and Kobe Prentice and Kendrick Law and Jalen Hale, wide receiver, the offensive line, to say nothing of the uh, the defense. So uh, I'm just looking forward to it. But at the same time, it's going to be a little sad. I think for a lot of people who have been in denial over Saban's retirement, it's going to hit home today when another coach is doing the post-practice press conference. You know, it feels like to me the whole Saban thing, it's like um, – Honestly, it's kind of like if my father were to retire here at Robinson Iron. I mean, he's been president for as long as I can remember at the company. And um, he says he's never going to retire. I mean, we love having him here. But um, if he ever were to retire, I think he'd still come here all the time. I mean, my grandfather, who started Robinson Foundry way back then, um, even after he was done, he would still come and just get on a forklift. I mean, right. you know, now people right. would look out because at the time he was 82 years old and uh, he couldn't see too well. You'd have to keep your head on a swivel. But, you know, I think that Saban just hanging around, again, is not a bad thing to me. It doesn't bother me at all. And I feel like it, it's making the transition even smoother. But going back to spring break, to, I mean, spring break, spring practice today, uh, it's the anti-spring break. So what newcomer, are you most happy to see? Now, somebody had a very interesting point in your roundtable. How about Keon Sapp? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, that was Potter, yeah. Uh, I think any of the transfer guys are interesting because unlike the freshmen, 
you're sort of expecting the transfers to play an immediate role, an immediate starting position, Parker Brailsford at center. I'll be surprised if he's not the one even today. Keon Sab is almost certainly going to be a one today. Jeremy Bernard knows the offense. He'll probably be a one at wide receiver. I think LT Overton has a little bit more of a crowded situation at the defensive line and where exactly is LT going to line up. I think that's more interesting. And, of course, Nakel Bertrand from uh, A&M wasn't signed to play right away, though he might. Uh, they didn't bring him in as a, oh, he's a day one guy. He was brought in as a, he's a guy we can develop. So I, I don't expect him to be a one, but he doesn't have as much competition at offensive tackle as, uh, as some other spots. But no, I, I like that that Keon Saab projection as a, an interesting Is guy Saab to watch. Not Saab? I don't know yet. I'm waiting to find out. Like everybody, I don't. I don't know. I Saab I've, would be Saab would be S A A B like Saab like the car. the car. Yeah. I'm not sure which one I prefer. I bet people say both. I've said both. As a matter of fact, I've said both and never really thought say, about it until right now. If it's if it's Sad. like I don't know, Bab, it's not Bob. Yeah, but that's B A B, right? Yeah, well, you can put another B in there. <laughs> put it in the front; it'd be silent. Maybe it's a Jamie French situation, and one of those B's is silent. French. Yeah. <laughs> now uh, um, we'll, we'll find out on the Keon Sab Sab. Uh, you know that that. That question. Sob. That's it's one of the questions of spring. How do you say some of the names? But uh, now I, I put down my answer for that, uh, just myself, the way I feel about it. And uh, Wednesday, uh, when, when the media is able to cover practice, and I'll, I'll be able to, to be a practice, by the way. Uh, I, I think, you know, for me, it'll be Austin Mack. You know, for me, it'll be Austin Mack. Like, what, what, um, you know, what does he look like? Now, I, don't get me wrong, and I, and I specifically wrote this out, my answer, uh, I'm not saying I'm looking forward to Austin Mack because I think he's going to push Jalen Miller. I actually think the complete opposite. I, I, I don't think Austin Mack will be in the picture at all for 2024. I think it's going to be Milro, and if it's not Milro, it might be Ty Simpson. But um, I'm real intrigued by watching Austin Mack play quarterback just because I feel not only – is he the quarterback of the future? It could be a really big future. I, I'm super excited about Austin Mack, so I'm really eager to see him play quarterback. Uh, so that that's my number one answer, even though that's really about the future. As far as what player am I looking forward to seeing newcomer that could affect 2024, I like the Keon Sab answer. Uh, I think that's cool. I'll tell you, a veteran, uh, and somebody else had this answer. I love it. Q Robinson. I, you know, he's a veteran and we've seen him and we know him and it's his year five and he's never been a full-time starter, but he's a critical full-time starter. Not only will he be a full-time starter on this team, he's critical. He He's replacing Dallas Turner, you know, who replaced Will Anderson as Alabama's best pass rusher. So we're going from Will to Dallas to Q Robinson. That's big shoes to fill. And I'm excited about the kid, but the more you think about it, the more you're like, you know, Dallas just lit up the NFL combine. I don't know they'd be saying that about Quandarius Robinson a year from now, though he is impressive physically, no, no doubt about that. Yeah, and speaking, what a good segue, Jimmy, because we're going to talk about Bama at the NFL combine right now. Actually, right now I'm going to tell you about FanDuel. Because you got to know about FanDuel. If, you had, if you've been listening to this, you already know about FanDuel. FanDuel.com slash locked on. Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 bucks if your bet wins. You can't beat that. Come on, y'all. Come on. <laughs> Seriously, get real. Get fanduel.com slash locked on. That's $150 if your bet wins. Bet on your favorite NBA players and teams with things like quick bets or live same game parlays or exclusive props for players or teams or games or whatever. And much, 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 much more. Just visit fanduel.com slash locked on to shoot your shot today because fanduel is an official partner of the NBA. So the NFL Combine uh, has begun. Is it still going on? Nope. Yeah. Over as of yesterday. Oh, it's over? Okay. 
Uh, it used to go so, into Monday. That's a good question because in the old days, I think Luke it, it it bled into Monday. I think they did Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. But starting, I think last year they went to Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday to make it more TV friendly. Um, so Dallas Turner was one of the big things to come out of uh, the combine. He really showed out uh, six listed at six, three. And again, when you go to the combine, they're not going to fudge the numbers like we all do in our media guide, or we all do in our head, or we all do when we run a blog or whatever. Um, he literally is six, three and two forty seven. Um, his wingspan or his arms are 34 inches and three, 34 and three eighths inches. Uh, his bench press, he didn't do the bench press three cone drill or 20 yard shuttle. I don't know why. I mean, I mean, I guess if you're so impressive on one arena, you're like, hey, you don't have to guess about the rest. Um, his 40-yard dash, though, is what turned hits. 4.46. That is moving in the 40-yard dash. I mean, he's faster than Terry on Arnold. I mean, we'll get to him in a minute, but, I mean, faster yeah, than – he's so faster. Funny. Yeah, he ran a faster 40 time than – some wide receiver DBs who may go in the first round. Uh, you know, he ran basically the same 40 time as Roma Dunze, who's who's a lock to go in probably the top six. Uh, that Dallas Turner, I mean, I love it. That, and I can't remember which GM it was, but a boy NFL combine had a great reaction from a GM right when Dallas Turner's 40 time was posted. This guy about fell out of his chair. He was, he was, he was going to run a four four down to the field to uh, get Dallas's Turner's name on an NFL contract. Look like, uh, yeah, Dallas did. I would say he made himself some money, but I don't know that he could go any higher than what he was already projected. I frankly, uh, I think that's a good I think point. He could be because of the quarter first situation. defensive player. Exactly, I think he was going to be. He may have cemented first defensive player taken in the draft, yeah. but he was probably going to be that guy anyway. But, hey, cement, it's a big deal. Let me explain to some people who, who might not know as much about the measurables and why it's important and and, and the, those same people that say, why, why do y'all care about the measurables when you have all that tape? The best people in the NFL, they, they need to know the measurables. They want to know the measurables because then they go back and watch the tape. For instance, Terry on Arnold ran a 4-5 flat. That is not – an ideal time for a cornerback. For instance, there were four first round cornerbacks last year. The slowest one was four, four, two. The other three were all in the four threes. So four, five, Oh, is not an ideal time for a first round corner. So does that mean Terry on is sunk? No, they're, they're armed with that information now. So they go back and watch Terry on's tape all over again. Now, knowing that it's a four, five, Oh, and they're like, does that hurt him? Where on this tape does that show up? Where on the tape does maybe him being a step or two slower than we believed, does that appear to be hurting him anywhere on this tape? So, so that's what the NFL guys, now that they know Dallas is as fast as he is, they go back and watch his tape again. And they're like, well, now, boy, now we see it, you know, and or uh, anyway, it's just more information. But they use that information in tape study. Tape is still far more important, but they want to be armed with the that type of information when they watch the tape. Yeah, that and again, as you said, great point about the the, the ceiling for Dallas Turner in terms of where he goes in the draft because th there are too many quarterbacks and maybe an offensive lineman that will go before him. I, I just think he top it, tops out at five or six, probably six to the Falcons is what I'm thinking. It's eight. Yeah, eight. Yeah, yeah, eight, eight's where the Falcons pick. Eight, eight's where the Falcons pick. And I couldn't agree more that that, I think, is the most likely landing spot unless somebody trades up. Uh, this is probably overly simplistic, but I watch a ton of NFL draft stuff. Right now, Luke, I would say the first three picks will be quarterbacks, Daniels, Caleb Williams, and, and, and Drake May in some order with Caleb Williams number one. Uh, I think the three picks after them could all be wide receivers, four, five, and six might be Marvin Harrison, Malik Neighbors, and Roma Dunze. I think uh, th those guys are very likely to all go next as the best non-quarterbacks in the draft. Uh, then that leads you to seven with the with the Titans, who either go offensive line or Brock Bowers. Uh, and then the Falcons, uh, assuming they're not addressing quarterback there because the Falcons are quarterback hungry, 
J.J. McCarthy such a stretch at eight. Uh, I think they're better off taking the first uh, defensive player. And if we're getting that deep in the NFL draft, I would also say as kind of a Falcons fan, what I hope they do is trade their second round and a fifth round pick to the Bears and get Justin Fields and, mm. you know, in this, and, and then take Dallas Turner at eight and walk Jeez. away from the first two rounds with Justin Fields and Dallas Turner. And I think you've dramatically improved your football team. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt about it. And just, I mean, uh, getting Justin Fields back to Georgia would be in interesting. Hometown. Hometown. I mean, that would be cool. Hometown. Um, that would be big. Uh, we can talk about some of these other guys, uh, but one other one that was interesting to me, two other ones, I guess. Jermaine Burton with a 4 4 yeah. 5. Um, pretty sporty uh, for him. And then Chris Braswell. I was a little shocked he was only at 4-6. I mean, I thought he and Turner would probably be neck and neck. Now, I mean, we're picking nits when you're talking about a tenth of a second. But um, still, I think when you see that information and then go back and look the tape, I think what you'll see is, oh, he plays faster than a 4-6, though. And and here's the other thing. The 40-yard dash is so overrated to me personally. I mean, yes, I mean, it's, it's like the universal – measuring stick for everybody but it's overrated because like when you see an offensive lineman run it offensive lineman always talk about i've never run 40 yards in my life except <laughs> right. for then um right. and then, and if you're dallas turner yes you might use it to run down somebody i mean we've seen some micah parsons and folks like that run down people from behind but for the most part it's like what do you do the seven yard dash in that's what we're really interested in right. They do measure that, by the way. I mean, well, yeah. they measure 10. They measure 10 in the 40. They're measuring the 10 and the 40, and the NFL uses both numbers. Couldn't agree more. By the way, Braswell, 4-6, that is well behind Dallas Turner, but was still, I think, the fourth or fifth best time amongst all the edge defenders. So, Braz did run really well compared to most humans, just not well compared to Cyborg, Dallas Turner. And, uh, hey, you know, when people say his measurables don't matter – I mean, Braz is a good player. We all know he's a good player, but he's not Dallas. And then I think, you know, they run those 40 times and you see, well, Dallas Turner's a better player than Chris Braswell. And we know why he's got that that tool in his tool belt, right? I mean, what what pass rushers at his size actually run in the 4-4 range? But uh, Braz did pretty good at 4-6. Burton's time is good, and Burton's got some skills. I'll just say I think Jermaine Burton is going to go lower than people think. In the draft, I do too. I think the attitude's going to get him. Yeah, I'm not going to say much about, but I do think it's he's going to go lower. And I'm sure people are listening to this and they're going to kill me in comments. I'll just say, wait till the draft. Wait till the, you know, hold off on killing me in the comments till the draft. And if he goes on day two, then light me up for being wrong, 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 wrong. But I think late day three, late day three for Burton. And uh, I think that's I, and hopefully I am wrong. I, I wish great things for every player that's ever played for Alabama. So it's not like I want to be right. Uh, I, I would heck. I hope he goes in the second round and and, and they accidentally overpay him fourteen million dollars. I mean, I, I want nothing but good things to happen for the kid. But uh, well, here's the thing, hey, it's Jimmy. A projection I would have him sixth round. He's not good enough to. To, to, to warrant taking a risk any earlier than that to me. I like Jermaine Burton. I want Jermaine Burton to see just like you. But when you go back and you do look at tape, you're going to see some incredible catches. You're going to see some fantastic moments. But you're going to see an attitude that is can be rough at times. You're going to see the Tennessee incident, which was bad, even though – and we thought he should have been suspended, even though we also understand, hey – when you run out on the field, you, sometimes you might get clocked. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not defending what he did. I'm just saying we have talked about that in the past. And I think that that, that may hurt him ultimately. But, uh, Jimmy, we're going to talk some SEC tournament bracketology when we return. But, you know, darn good and well, I want to tell you about Nissan. 
I mean, I can't wait. I'm so glad Nissan's with us now. What what can I say about Nissan that I hadn't already said before? Probably a lot because I've only said it once. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. You got the Nissan Rogue. You got the Nissan Pathfinder. You got the Nissan Armada. Take the Nissan Rogue. Pathfinder or Armada and go find your big adventure ASAP at shopnissan.com. Look, just a few little things here. Uh, Nissan Pathfinder has up to eight room, up to eight people, an expansive cargo capacity and advanced capable four by four capability with 284 horsepower. Holy cow. And up to 6,000 pounds of towing. When adventure calls, the Pathfinder is there to answer. I know a lot of people that have owned Pathfinders and they've loved them. The Nissan Armada 2024 will change what you expect from a full-size SUV. Picture a rugged 4x4 that can seat up to 8 in first-class luxury and style, tow bigger, and explore further with the 24 Armada. What you want to do is go check out any of these, the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada. Go find that next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. There's a great site. Um, I hope I can read it. So go to bball.notnothing.net. <laughs> I don't, that's the worst, worst yeah. address ever. bball.notnothing.net. Now, what it, you can do is get, for the SEC tournament is plug in who wins these final two games for each game remaining, and it will show you where that team will be seated. Now, we know that and, and maybe some of y'all don't love this. I, I do. I just love the bracketology. I love the future schedules. I love all that stuff. But so if you assume and this is assuming makes, you know, uh ass out of you and me, we know that. Um but I'm assuming Florida's going to win Tuesday. I I think that's fair. fair. I mean, it that's just fair. seems like I mean, we have not done well on the road against good teams, and uh, they are a good team, and then they'll be on the road, and that place will be hopping. They need a win to boost their resume a little bit, and a loss doesn't kill us, but it would be great to win. I'm going to assume Florida wins. I'm going to assume Ole Miss beats Georgia. I'm going to assume Auburn beats Missouri. I'm going to assume that – well, actually, I'm going to assume Georgia beats Ole Miss. I'm going to take that back because it's at Georgia. So I'm going to assume – I'm going to assume LSU beats Arkansas because it feels like they're just done for the year. I'm going to assume Kentucky beats Vanderbilt. And now here's where the tricky one, South yeah. Carolina. Can see Tennessee. South Carolina. That's tough because it's at South Carolina. Now, I also have to fill in March 9th to make this work. So I'll assume Bama beats Arkansas because, again, I think they will. Auburn beats Georgia. LSU beats Missouri. A &E, uh, Ole Miss beats A&M. Mississippi State beats South Carolina at State. And, and Tennessee wins at home and Florida beats Vandy. Tennessee wins over. Now I click on calculate seeds. Here we go. And what that would leave us with this. How about this potential? Tennessee would be the one, South Kakalaki would be the four, Bama the two, and Auburn the three. Wow. So Bama and Auburn could play on Saturday, uh, both wow. with double buys. That would make a very interesting SEC tournament. Who would Alabama game. play on Friday? Uh, the winner of AM Mississippi State and uh Auburn would play probably Florida. They would beat either Missouri or Georgia, I would think. I'm not sure and, Auburn uh, would beat Florida. And, and hey, I'm, <laughs> uh, you know, Alabama would be a solid favorite over AM or Mississippi State. But I also would tell you going in that the games would likely be tight. Likely. Yeah, I agree. Now, I'm just going to make one change. Alabama Auburn on that Saturday would be fun stuff. I'm going to make one change. I did say I'd said South Carolina to beat Tennessee. I'm going to change that Tennessee to beat South Carolina. But I'm also going to change. Let's just pretend like, tend like Alabama beats Florida. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden now, nothing changes. Dang it. Uh, uh, yeah, Alabama's still a two, right? I would think Alabama's still Alabama, a two. If Tennessee, if Tennessee uh, you know, wins out, Tennessee's going to have to lose twice for yeah. Alabama to be a one, really. So, but what if could what if Alabama wins it's both games and Tennessee beats South Carolina but loses at home to Kentucky, which is very possible? Uh, then there would be Alabama a tie. Still, 
but Alabama, yeah, would, still Alabama be the two. would still be the two. But Kentucky would be the three. I don't know what I want here. I don't. I'd, I'd rather. I, I don't rather play saying, I don't enjoy playing Auburn in anything for any reason ever for any reason ever or anything ever. So I, I don't enjoy. I, it. I'm a dude guy, you know. I'm into. You know, I, in, in terms of picking games, to me, it's going to be about dudes. And I know Auburn's had a better season than Kentucky, but Kentucky's dudes still scare me more than Auburn. And Auburn's good. I've, I've been praising Auburn all year. They are good. Either match will be tough for me. How about you? I, I'd rather play Auburn. I, I think you're going to say Kentucky. The logic tells me I'd rather play Auburn. My heart and growing up in Tallapoosa County, Alabama, tells me I don't want to play Auburn for any reason ever for anything under any circumstance, no matter what the occasion. So, um, you know, and I'm going to switch one other thing. What if, what if Tennessee goes 0-2 these last two? And what if Alabama goes 2-0? Well, Alabama would be the one. SEC and champions. that would make Auburn the five and Tennessee the four. You could end up playing South Auburn Carolina. on Friday. I mean, boy, and we played the winner of Ole Miss LSU, which, you know, hey, we beat both of them. Uh, in fact, right. we beat LSU twice. Um, I just I, – I think this is so interesting. Other people yeah. may think, what are you doing all these possibilities for? I love it. I just think it's so cool. Um, and I'm so – boy, it does make me – I'm so – I'm a little more sad today than I was yesterday about Alabama losing Saturday. Um and it sure would be nice to have that one seed, but look, I I think you do. Logic tells us you want to avoid Kentucky until the final day, if it, if at all humanly possible, over any other team because pick, they show who's up. Who's your pick to win the tournament? Right now, my pick would have to be Tennessee, I think, but it, my second pick would be Kentucky. That's exactly how I feel. Tennessee one, Kentucky two, um, maybe Alabama three, maybe. I know this, the SEC is really tough. So, in my mind, Friday, you're going to play a good basketball team on Friday. And you're going to play – if you get to Saturday, you're going to play a great team. I don't care who it is. Yeah, you're going you're to play a great team Saturday unless there's some shocking upsets. But I doubt that. So, I think if you play Auburn, Tennessee, or Kentucky, whew, lace them up. You might play South Carolina – they're really good, and they're going to want a piece of Alabama after what happened earlier this year. They, they um, would want a piece of Alabama or Auburn because we beat them by like twenty-seven. Auburn beat them by forty. Yeah, that's now, true. Here's the one. Here's also the one. Fl Florida's Alabama, is really good too. Yeah, here's the one thing I think Alabama is positive for Alabama in terms of uh, the tournament. I think as the as the time goes on. It's harder to play good defense when you're tired. I think you can play better offense when you're tired than 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 good defense. And the teams that have give us the most trouble are teams that play really good defense, like a Tennessee, like a Kentucky, uh, on occasion, uh, like an Auburn. Um, I think it, we will be uh, we will be better suited to make a run. And I also like our depth. Our depth is getting better to me, um, especially when Reitzel comes back. You know, I feel like our depth will be okay. And um, so, anyway, that's going to do it. We'll, we'll have more on the SEC tournament. I just found this website and found it fascinating. I hope you guys like it. I would encourage you to check it out, especially if you enjoy doing these type of things like I do. But that's going to do it for today's podcast. We'll be back tomorrow with more. And until then, roll tight, everybody. Roll tight.